Today is September 16, 2014. I'm Laura Wagner um, and talking to Michelle Mumbras, um, doing an oral history and conversation um, that will be part of the Radio Haiti archive at the Rubenstein Library at Duke University. Um, so Michelle, for the sort of just to set down the basic facts, could you tell us your full name? your date of birth and where you were born. I am Michel Montas, uh, otherwise known as Michel Montas Dominique. Uh, I was born in, on November uh, 13th, uh, 1946. And um, I was born in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, where I lived uh, most of my uh, childhood. And uh, I, uh, I've been back on and off uh, to Haiti uh, for uh, a while. So I'm just going to jump in with what inspired you to become a journalist? Well, several things, several things that go back, way back to, uh, to my childhood. You know, when I was uh, uh, growing up on the uh, Duvalier, during the Duvalier years of the dictatorship in Haiti, um, to me, uh, it was uh, a period of silence and of fear. And uh, I decided when I became um, ready to go to uh, study that uh, I no longer wanted to be afraid and I no longer wanted to be silenced. That's why I decided to be a journalist. Even though my parents were against it, so my father thought it was a very uh, bad idea uh, to, uh, if I wanted to come, go back to Haiti to be a journalist, it was too dangerous uh, work, and uh, being a journalist in Haiti was not a particularly a, partic a very good way of practicing the, the journalism because uh, there was no freedom of the press uh, at the time I went to study, and no, there wa was there any at the time when I got back to Haiti. So, uh, what pushed me to be a journalist? was what I lived through. I lived through, uh, I was uh, 17 when uh, uh, I saw, you know, dead bodies in the streets and uh, I was uh, late in my 17th year, uh, my uh, family, my uncle, my, my aunt and four of my cousins were arrested and they were killed. Uh, they were taken to Fort Dimanche, the infamous uh, prison under the Duvalier regime and they were killed. So uh, I left Haiti right after that. And to me, uh, that event really marked my choice. I decided that uh, I could no longer accept this to continue. And one way I thought I could change it is by being a journalist. Even though I didn't have a clear idea of how I would talk about it as a journalist uh, because of the conditions of the press in Haiti, but I still thought uh, that was the thing to do. So for you, it was about sort of revealing the truth, talking about events that were happening. And it was speaking out. Okay. It was giving other people the chance to speak out. And I think that's probably why uh, later on I would choose radio, because that was the media where uh, people could start airing their views. And at the very beginning when I started working at the radio, it was not about, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, reporting as much as it was, uh, you know, getting a microphone to people who had been silenced for two centuries. I just felt that uh, uh, that was the important thing for me, and uh, that's why I chose that profession. Can you tell me more about um, what the press was like in Haiti in the 60s under Duvalier, the well, official press? Yeah, well, the official press, there was no press to okay. the extent that all the, the newspapers, you had newspapers, uh, and the newspapers, all they did was, of course, to carry government uh, uh, declaration, go government statements, or government uh, um, uh, speeches, you know, official speeches. There was uh, really no real reporting done, mm -hmm. and uh, not even on, on just uh, small everyday events. Nothing was, uh, uh, newspapers were really uh, government uh, controlled. And uh, the, the press, the international press, was censored to the extent that you could not, uh, if you had any article in a foreign newspaper uh, about Haiti, it was cut out, physically, out of the newspaper. Which means if, uh, for instance, the New York Times or Le Monde had an article about Duvalier, 
that was cut out. You could get your paper but without that. So uh, it was a period, and the, the local press, of course, uh, uh, in terms of uh, radio, there was no such thing. Uh, radio was just music. Uh, radio existed, of course, uh, but it was mostly about, uh, uh, you know, uh, musical uh, uh, programs. It was uh, uh, advertisement uh, uh, and nothing more than that. There was no news uh, on the radio. Of course, there couldn't be any news because of the political situation under uh, François Duvalier. Uh, of course, when I came back, things had slightly changed, and uh, there was more of an opportunity then. But uh, if you want, we can talk about this uh, uh, later. Sure. Um, so you did your training at Columbia University um, in the late 60s, which was sort of a time of significant social change in the US. How did that inform the way you thought about what was going on back home? I don't think that formed the way uh, uh, I, I, uh, I saw the reality in realities in Haiti. I lived through those realities, so I knew my reaction towards those realities and my, uh, my uh, you know, let's say latent activism at the time, because I couldn't express it, of course, in Haiti. Uh, but uh, the idealism I carried with me uh, brought me close to uh, the people who were protesting the Vietnam War. And I got involved, uh, you know, very much uh, with student groups on campus. And uh, I was very politically uh, uh, engaged into a number of things happening. I don't know whether it informed my, uh, uh, my vision. Let's, let's say it nourished it. It, uh, it brought something to it. And uh, it uh, uh, helped me kind of express some of my own uh, uh, thoughts and uh, feelings. So when did you return to Haiti? I returned to Haiti after uh, when uh, François Duvalier died. Uh, he died in his bed, and uh, he, uh, his son, uh, Jean-Claude Duvalier, inherited the country from him. And uh, um, we, I, I went back uh, right after uh, Duvalier died in the 70s, hoping uh, in 71, 72, hoping that maybe things would slightly change. Uh, at the time, uh, there was some pressure for uh, the changes to take place. And, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm talking about external pressures. And uh, I felt that maybe we could, um, you know, change things. Um, at the beginning, of course, uh, going back on Jean-Claude Duvalier, uh, I started working at Le Nouvelis, which was a daily paper. And uh, working at the Nouvelliste, uh, that daily paper, was um, quite uh, uh, an odd experiment. <coughs> I had uh, been taught journalism the way it's supposed to be practiced. And I had to put aside everything I'd learned. You know, here I was uh, coming back from Colombia uh, with uh, all sorts of principles about you know, how you deal with uh, 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 reporting. And, uh, and I realized that uh, it had to be um, I had to start feeling uh, the, the, the ground, the field. Um, I had majored in political affairs. When I got there to the newspaper, uh, I was told by the chief editor, listen, um, the only thing, if you are a woman, you are, uh, uh, whether you have a political affairs degree is irrelevant, uh, you are going to be talking about culture. So I was given a cultural page. And uh, I started through my cultural page to put quite a few things that interest me. And I wrote about politics, but international politics, under an assumed name. It was not my name. And for a long time, uh, for not a long time, I, I worked uh, uh, between uh, in 70, 70, what, 72, 73, um, I worked uh, at uh, Le Nouvelliste. And, uh, um, but this interrupted by a, a trip to, to France, where I had a, a fellowship, a scholarship, uh, to work in, America, in French newspapers uh, for about six months. So uh, in between all this, uh, I really didn't work that long in the Nouvelliste, the, the daily paper. And uh, I decided that, that what really worked in Haiti was radio. And what really worked was a station I was listening to which was Radio Haiti. And Radio Haiti at the time had started uh, not doing news yet, but doing uh, some, uh, um, let's say, uh, 
experiment about Creole and about culture, introducing what they call the Haitian identity into a nondescript uh, uh, media landscape where uh, everything was French and everything was about what the Western world thought, you know, uh, about things, music, everything was, uh, 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 let's say, colored by that. And uh, what uh, Radio Haiti was doing was first introducing Creole, doing interviews with people who were involved, but not only with intellectuals, doing interviews with uh, Hungans, which means Vodou priests, doing interviews with people in the streets. It was very slow at the beginning and very timid because there was no way it could be different. And then slowly, um, and then one day I met Jean-Dominique and he asked me to come and train his journalist. They had started a newsroom and uh, uh, what I was doing essentially was uh, kind of uh, helping to train the journalist. I had a, a, a news uh, show for a while, uh, but it was mostly, uh, I was still at the same time uh, working as uh, the editor of a magazine called Conjunction, which was an intellectual magazine about uh, uh, sociological issues and things of that sort. And uh, uh, slowly I got more and more involved with the radio. And in uh, 73, 74, uh, it became uh, more and more my main concern and, uh, um, and uh, involvement. What do you think that radio as a medium can do in general and, um, and specifically in Haiti? Well, I think it's, uh, uh, you have a number of oral societies where uh, uh, only uh, part of the population is, uh, um, has learned to read and, read and write. Uh, radio has also uh, the ability to reach uh, beyond mountains. In the case of Haiti, it was a very, uh, as in the case of uh, villages in uh, Latin America, everywhere, you know, radio as a way of reaching people uh, that newspapers uh, does not, uh, a newspaper does not have. So to me, it was a, a no-brainer. I mean, radio was the place to be. Uh, radio can uh, not only reach people, but uh, Trans immediately transmit people's thoughts and ideas and opinions. And I felt that, uh, 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 you know, I learned as I went on. I learned, for instance, that uh, it was in a way changing things by just uh, giving uh, the microphone to a, a coffee grower in the, um, let's say, in the north of the country. And having a coffee grower from the South listen to that, they had never heard each other's voice. They did not know of the problems that each confronted. The speculators, the people buying the coffee beans from them at a very low price and selling them on the international market. At the same time, we would broadcast the price of coffee on the international market. So these brought together created um, something amazingly powerful. At the beginning, we were not allowed, of course, to talk about politics. We were not allowed to talk about anything that would, uh, <clears throat> let's say, endanger uh, the peace, as they said. Uh, we were under a dictatorship, and uh, you could talk about uh, even things like garbage in the street was a political matter. You know, you wouldn't talk about things that we talked about later on in uh, 78, 79, 80. At that time, when we started talking about both people, well, both people existed before. Haitian workers have been, uh, you know, voting with their feet for a very long time. But we, it was those subjects you didn't, at the beginning, talk about. You know, even, in fact, one of our reporters doing a, uh, an investigation on prostitution was arrested. And we had to get him out of jail. Um, so it was a constant, uh, uh, it was a tightrope. You didn't know all, you had to, to really, uh, and I think I counted a lot on Jean's, on Jean's analysis of the situation, which was, I was much younger, and, uh, you know, all our reporters were very young, you know. But Jean had that sense that, well, you can't talk about this, or uh, uh, maybe you should talk about it this way. And it was, uh, it was an era of self-censorship, of course. But by touching on subjects that were never touched before, I think we did 
uh, manage to expand um, the, um, the scope of uh, uh, what could be talked about. And slowly, in 78, 79, at that time it was the Carter administration. The Carter administration was saying, uh, we get, give you money to the government. We give you money uh, on one condition, is that there is respect for human rights. So the whole human rights issue as being li linked to foreign aid actually changed the picture in Latin America altogether. It changed the picture certainly in Haiti to the extent that uh, more and more we were allowed to cover more things. And not just at the level of the press, you know, uh, slowly labor unions that had been really destroyed under Duvalier the father uh, were suddenly started um, emerging again. And, uh, uh, but even then, 78, 79, there was uh, on our part uh, a certain amount of, uh, of self-censorship to the extent that uh, I would, for instance, uh, cover, uh, you know, uh, labor unions would come to me and say, okay, we have uh, uh, five branches in five different factories. I said, guys, listen, I'll talk about one. Today I won't talk about five. Because we knew that it was such a tight rope that if we had five, then we would have, uh, uh, you know, an interdiction on the part of the government. There would be a reaction on the part of the government. And we had to do it slowly. And uh, in 78, 79, 80, that's when we actually started really doing uh, active reporting. Uh, because uh, uh, Jean-Claude Duvalier was forced to open uh, some of the uh, uh, you know, fields that were closed before, some of the taboo subjects you know, were uh, no longer taboo. Of course, we couldn't talk about political prisoners. We knew they were there. We couldn't talk about them. Uh, we uh, always had to, um, even, you know, people, labor unions, for instance, workers complaining about the, the conditions in their factories will come and say first, you know, uh, we, we are sure the president uh, does not know about this. That's why we have to tell him about this. So there was always, people had the, the, the reaction of always, you know, putting some form of uh, buffer so there won't be another crackdown because we had lived you know, through François Duvalier, through a period of uh, uh, a very bloody and repressive regime. So we still had the mechanism of uh, uh, the dictatorship, which was still there. I mean, the repression would strike any time things were getting a little more, uh, uh, you know, heated around some issues. And uh, um, it was a cat and mouse thing, you know. Uh, we knew the cat was always ready to jump at us. And, uh, but in, the, in 78, 79, we ta started talking about boat people. We started talking about braceros, the Haitian workers, sugarcane cutters going to the Dominican Republic, uh, which during the Duvalier years had been um, kind of a monopoly of the government. I mean, they would sell uh, workers to the Dominican Republic for the sugarcane harvest. So talking about it, this was uh, always a difficult subject. Um, there are a number of things uh, we had to, to we, we would talk about, but in a very um, careful fashion. Um, for instance, there was a whole issue of uh, a toxic waste uh, that uh, a boat came to the Gonaive region and uh, uh, brought uh, a number of toxic waste from uh, uh, I don't know where it came from originally. The boat had been going throughout the world, carrying the same toxic waste and trying to find a place to dump them. And they got an agreement with uh, some people close to the government, to the, the government at the time. And the, they were dumped, the waste was dumped in uh, Gonaive. And uh, when we talked about this, what really made a tremendous difference was the fact that people would gather around this issue because it was an issue of pride. And the government couldn't stop us from talking about it. Even though the people were involved, and we, we actually said so, were people close to them, close to the army at the time. They were members of the army at the time. And we actually um, you know, denounced the whole, the whole ploy. And um, they couldn't stop us. The same way, they opened, for instance, so-called senatorial elections, and no, no not senatorial, uh, Congress elections. Uh,
because, uh, of course, there was no question of presidential election with Jean-Claude Duvalier, but uh, the election uh, created just open a Pandora box. There were candidates. There was one candidate in the, in the uh, north of the country who, who became a congressman, and that candidate, uh, uh, his name was Le Rouge, uh, managed to uh, bring, just to carry with him all the uh, anger of the north, the northern part of the country, on issues that were never solved by the government, that were never addressed by the government. So that campaign created also, I mean, there, was more, there were more and more people just protesting and saying no and refusing to accept the conditions of the past. So um, these were difficult years, but uh, until, of course, uh, um, they destroyed the station. So that was going to be my next question. So you're talking about this period of relative, relative freedom, relative ability to talk about things that could never be spoken about before. Um, what happened in November 1980, and how did that come about? Well, November 1980, I think the government decided that uh, uh, they could strike for one simple reason, because of the U.S. elections. Uh, you had had elections where uh, Ronald Reagan had become the president of the United States. Um, it was the end of the Carter administration that was demanding that uh, uh, um, human rights be respected. And uh, uh, at the time, uh, I remember the election, in the U.S. elections, we were covering that at the radio in the middle of the night uh, when uh, uh, we announced the results. We heard people from our studios downtown. We heard, you know, people shout, um, shooting in the in the air, and they were Makuts who were saying, "Human rights are over. The cowboys are back in the White House." And uh, uh, we knew our days were counted. We started being com constantly the last month November, of November, November 1980 been constantly attacked by um, the media, the government, the government media. And uh, uh, we knew that things were getting more and more difficult for us. And Thanksgiving Day in the US, November 28, 1980, they struck. It was a Friday. They were convinced that there would be no reaction on the part of a lame duck administration, which was uh, the Carter administration. And uh, at the time when uh, they struck, it was not just the media. In the case of, the case of Radio Haiti, we were totally destroyed. Everyone was at the station was arrested, uh, taken to Caserne des Salines. And then while we were at the Caserne des Salines, we realized that uh, there were students there, there were intellectuals, there were human rights activists, there were uh, uh, lawyers, former candidates, you know. It was everyone that could move in Haiti was just in one day arrested. Just the whole, uh, and the country fell once more into complete silence. And uh, in the case of Radio Haiti, we were the hardest hit in terms of the media because everyone was just taken, and the station was physically destroyed with, actually they came with uh, um, their, uh, uh, their guns and they would hit um, with uh, the, the, the machine guns, they would hit, uh, not shoot at them, but hit the, uh, the record player. And you know, they destroyed everything. Uh, of course, they, they didn't know how to turn off uh, the station, so we were on the air. So people heard all that. And uh, um, we were all taken. And we never saw that station uh, until we came back in 1986 again. But in between, there was, of course, uh, exile for us, for few of us. Some of my journalists stayed in jail a month, one of them a year, another one two years. Um, uh, we were expelled because uh, there was a strong protest on the part of the lame duck administration, uh, the Carter administration, uh, and we were released uh, uh, five days later. Uh, with the clothes on our back, uh, put it on a plane. And we, the first, we were the first to be expelled. There were four of us uh, expelled. There was uh, uh, another journalist from another radio station. 
uh, you know, one uh, uh, human rights activist. We were four of us expelled. We arrived in Miami, and we had to explain to them that we were just expelled. Thank God, they had, there was a newspaper, the Miami Herald was on the um, immigration guy's uh, uh, desk, where it was cracked down in Haiti, and it was about us. So they kept our, our passports at the US uh, uh, immigration uh, uh, office. And uh, I just uh, went to, the, to New York with, uh, because there were some Haitians there at the airport showing their uh, solidarity and they, they paid my flight to, uh, to New York. And where was Jean at the time? Jean at the time, um, we were looking, I know they were looking for Jean. I could, I had no news, and I found out later that when he heard, he was outside of the station, when he heard them coming to the station, through the, you know, through the air, I mean, he heard the, uh, the commotion, and uh, he came down with friends, and then the friend was driving him, just turned around and refused to drop him off, uh, telling him what is the use, and Jean had to go into hiding, and for about uh, uh, five, six days, then, he was uh, taken to uh, the Venezuelan embassy, and from the Venezuelan embassy, he flew to Caracas. And uh, we met again uh, in uh, January 1981. That's when he came and joined me in New York. And how much did you get to talk to him during that time? Very little, very little, because uh, the first, the, um, the Venezuelan embassy did not want to say uh, that he was there. So I would call from New York, and they would say there is no such person here. And it took a while, uh, even though, uh, I, but I did get confirmation that he was there, and we did manage to speak twice or three times before he actually made it uh, to Caracas. Um, I'm actually gonna jump back a little bit in the chronology, if that's okay. Um, can you tell us um, about how Jean-Dominique bought Radio Haiti? How did that come about? Mm -hmm. um, and what's the story? Well, the story of, of Jean is also very much linked to the dictatorship. In uh, 1957, Jean was, uh, he had uh, uh, received his uh, degree from uh, uh, Paris. Uh, he was an, an, uh, an agronomist, and uh, he came back to Haiti and was working in the northern part of the country. Uh, it was right before uh, uh, Duvalier was in power. Uh, he started working in the northern part of the country. And uh, he was working, he was a specialist of uh, uh, cocoa and coffee, and he was co working with the coffee growers. He also worked at, uh, uh, on a on uh, rubber plantation. And uh, one day, he was arrested, as he was when he found out that his brother had uh, tried to land in Haiti. His brother was in the military. He was in the army, an, of, an officer of the army, and uh, three of them uh, came to, back to Haiti. They were in exile, three officers, to try to overthrow the regime. And uh, Philippe Dominique, Jean's brother, was killed. Jean, at the time, was trying to reach Port-au-Prince, and he was arrested in Gonaïve. He spent six months in jail in Gonaïve, and from uh, Gonaïve, he came back to Port-au-Prince because he no longer had a job. Being an agronomist uh, and considered to be against the government is not uh, particular. It's not uh, helpful to get a job. Let's put it this way, because all the, the jobs as agronomists are government jobs. So he uh, started looking for things to do in Port-au-Prince. He, he, he taught for a while uh, until he started uh, having some interests at uh, in a radio. And uh, the radio was then owned by, uh, Radio Haiti was owned by uh, uh, Ricardo Widmayer, who had founded it in the 1930s. And uh, uh, Jean started just uh, uh, renting some space and uh, having a program a, 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 a week. Uh, he would sell publicity and sell advertisement and just have that on his show. It was, uh, so it was, uh, you know, not a, particularly uh, a stable uh, position, but uh, when uh, uh, Ricardo Widmayer offered him to buy the station, 
He said, yes. He tried to find the money, he gathered the money, and he bought the station. At the time, the station was not very powerful. It was not reaching uh, uh, very far. And uh, Jean, in the 70s, uh, just invested into a 10 kilowatt AM station. Uh, I have to say that uh, at the time, there was one thing that really um, was the backdrop of the explosion of radio at the time. Um, a number of churches had distributed small transistor radios, which were blocked on their own frequencies. They were radio stations uh, 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 that were manned by the churches. And uh, uh, what happened is that uh, people managed to just change uh, the channels uh, to uh, Radio Haiti 1330. And that's when we started realizing that we were uh, reaching much, much more people than we expected. We were covered pretty much most of the country in spite of the mountainous nature of Haiti. And uh, uh, it was a time when uh, I think uh, radio started to mean something to people because it reached them and we started talking about issues that concerned them. So that's how Jean got into the radio. I mean, he started uh, uh, as an experiment uh, uh, of uh, someone who was out of a job because of the dictatorship and was trying to, uh, um, you know, find a way to just uh, earn a living. And, uh, and, and he became slowly, Jean was passionate about everything he was doing. And he became passionate about radio. So he bought the station in 1970. And then it sort of took off by 1972. Mm -hmm. um, how did he get the money to do that? Who were his supporters? He, he, he borrowed money mm -hmm. from the bank. He borrowed money from friends. He borrowed money, uh, you know, he got help from family. And uh, so it was uh, uh, what they call in, ha in Haiti a quetzalban, <laughs> which is a, a kind of uh, gathering money here and there to try to... Uh, uh, to, to invest into the radio and make it uh, a more powerful uh, tool. And did most of those supporters, was, was it because they were um, personal friends, family of Jean, or was it also um, that, they, that they liked the idea of it and they wanted that to happen? They wanted well, they didn't know what the radio uh, was going to be. I think uh, when they invested into the radio, to him, to them, uh, you know, he was a man who was uh, uh, of great culture and uh, uh, who spoke French beautifully and, uh, you know, who could do programs about uh, and talk to the intellectuals of Haiti. Uh, so that's what they supported. Uh, they never, I don't think, they envisioned what Radio Haiti became uh, after that, you know, which was uh, uh, more and more, particularly in the last few years of its existence, a station for the poorest of the poor. S can you tell me about, about your relationship with Jean-Dominique as, as partners, as people with this shared, um, this shared professional relationship and also as um, accomplices? Uh, well, at the beginning, it was uh, there was nothing. Uh, uh, well, there was some professional respect on on both sides, but it was just it was just mad love. I mean, I was madly in love with the man; he was madly in love with me, and um, that's how it started. Uh, of course, uh, uh, I think when he asked me to uh, train his journalist, it was a professional call. But <laughs> I, uh, and it became more and more that I think exile, the, our first exile in 1980, from 1980 to 1986, our second exile, and we can talk about this later. Our second exile in uh, in um, 91 to 94 uh, really brought us closer and closer together. Working together, we were uh, actually anchoring the same news program in the morning uh, from 7 a.m. to 8.30 every morning. Um, the fact that uh, uh, we had our specific space within the radio, uh, I was more the newsroom person. He was uh, uh, more the one doing the editorials, the, the long interviews, uh, the in-depth uh, 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 analysis of, uh, of uh, the situation, which is what he liked to do. And I was the hands-on person, just taking care of assigning uh, 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 
subjects to journalists in the morning, discussing with them on how to cover this or how to cover that. Um, but a lot of it had to do also with uh, the station, a lot of it has to do with John's vision. And uh, I share that vision, you know, what he wanted the station to become. Uh, in the middle, in the midst of all this uh, shared uh, uh, work, uh, there was a tremendous friendship and um, complicity. I mean, we, um, when I tell people that he would bring me coffee in the morning at four o'clock in the morning to read uh, uh, me his editorial of the day, and uh, people would ask me, but how can you tolerate this? How could you accept this? Well, he brought me coffee. He made the coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it was certainly a very intense relationship, a very intense time. We were living through intense times. Everything was intense. And uh, uh, people say, how could you live with John? You just so uh, all the time doing things and all the time so energetic. And, uh, and I used to laugh and say, well, no problem. You know, whenever we are got, they cut off the electricity at the station, we can just plug the station on Jean. Mm -hmm. And he's, he can be the, <laughs> the one. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> it can be the one actually, uh, uh, you know, powering the station. So what, um, what was daily life like in exile, 1980 to 1986? What were you and Jean doing? Well, in 1980, uh, 81, uh, when we came to New York, we felt we had to uh, just create a new life for ourselves. Uh, uh, to us, uh, the dictatorship was not going to fall. Uh, to us, uh, uh, we are there for uh, an indefinite number of years. Uh, we felt uh, uh, it was a time of uh, experiment for Jean because uh, New York was new to him. Uh, he started doing a few things for uh, uh, um, diaspora radio stations, uh, Haitian radio stations in New York. Uh, in the meantime, I found work at the United Nations, and I started working for the radio. And uh, it's, uh, you know, I uh, worked for them uh, between 1981 uh, uh, and, no, 82, 1982 and 1986. And uh, we just managed to live that way, uh, and we survived that way. And um, of course, I have to say that uh, every time I was expelled, or every time I had to leave the country for political reasons, I was back at the UN working at UN Radio. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, um, uh, the United Nations was kind of the niche that I had found uh, whenever I was not uh, working at Radio Haiti. At what point? Um, at what point did you become aware that the dictatorship's days were numbered? Uh, we were not aware of it. Uh, to us, uh, uh, of course, we were doing everything we could uh, in terms of mobilization, in terms here uh, in the U.S., in terms of uh, uh, you know speaking out uh, with the diaspora, telling them what was happening. Uh, we didn't see it coming. Of course, we heard uh, that uh, uh, there were uh, um, you know a number of uh, movements, but we had seen that before. We had seen under Jean-Claude Duvalier movements from peasants, movements for uh, just going against the regime and being defeated. So we didn't see it until one day we got a phone call from Gigi, our daughter, who is also a journalist. Uh, her name is also Jean, Jean-Dominique. Uh, Gigi called us and said, uh, uh, that's it, it's gone. And uh, Jean, Jean says, no, you must be, what are you saying? You know, I mean, it's not possible. And uh, uh, she made us listen to, on the phone to Radio Soleil. Radio Soleil was the station that had more or less taken over from us. Most of the media had been silent, but the, the church, the Catholic church, and uh, the, what I, I would call the Tileglise, which is the, 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 you know, uh, the small churches in the, within the Catholic church, but that were based on uh, grassroots organizations, and the, the, there was a different, they had started to uh, actually do some of what we were doing before uh, we were struck down in 1980. And uh, she made us, and she, they had been closed. And Gigi made us hear Radio Soleil. And that, uh, that song has stayed with me for the rest of my life. 
which was a song about Radio Soleil uh, uh, reopening. And uh, then we believed it. We immediately made plans to come back. I, c I, uh, I went, of course, I, I flew down with Jean uh, a month later. And, uh, we, uh, uh, in, and we arrived in Port-au-Prince. What we didn't expect, what, what we saw at the airport. Uh, when the plane landed, uh, we saw a number of military men on the tarmac. And Jean told me, that's it, they've come for us again. And he was very surprised when we went down. There were so many people, thousands and thousands of people at the airport. And they were there to welcome Jean. And the military was trying to appear democratic. They had a member of every corps saluting Jean as he went down the staircase, the, 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 you know, from the plane. And it's, uh, uh, it was an amazing day, an amazing day. Um, I was separated from Jean. Pulled, he, he was pulled uh, ahead of us. Um, put in a, in a car, and I had the feeling that people were carrying that car. There were so many people around the car, it could you know, almost not move. And uh, for, some, for some reason, they happened to arrive to uh, the former station, which had not been open. No one had touched it. Even though the doors were open, the studios were destroyed, and that's where they took uh, us. It was really an amazing day. Were you surprised to see that? Very, very. I mean, uh, it was it had was linked also to uh, the pe people's uh, uh, joy at the fact that the dictatorship had fallen, that Jean Claude Duvalier had to leave. So there was that spirit. It was about Radio Haiti, but it was about you know getting back to freedom of speech, getting back to uh, being able to uh, air your own feelings, being able to uh, uh, talk about things that you know, concerned your life. It was ending what they call babouquette. The babouquette is what you put on your, on your mouth so you can't talk. And they said, they used to say babouquette la tombe, which means we are no longer have this on our mouth. We can't speak out again. So that was that feeling that, that day of, it was the fervor after uh, the, the fall of the dictatorship. It was also, you know, welcoming back a station that was seen as a voice of the people. So how did, how did your content change? How did the tone change after 86? Of course it changed. It was, uh, uh, first we had, um, you know, uh, even though our own journalists came back, who had been arrested and had been with us before, they came back and joined us. But there were also so many journalists. It's like, you know, mushroom after the rain, you know, you had, everyone wanted to be a journalist. And it was, there was that fervor, that enthusiasm uh, about being a journalist and about working uh, for a radio station like ours. Of course, it took us a while to rebuild the station. And what really amazed us is that uh, a committee was formed, not by us, outside of us, to raise money for Radio Haiti. And what was surprising is that the money came from the business community, came from you know, intellectuals, it came from people in liberal, uh, liberal uh, uh, jobs, but most of it came from people who contributed 50 cents, uh, a gold, five golds, uh, which was then the equivalent of a dollar. You know, market women who would save that money from, you know, the day's uh, 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 selling of uh, fried uh, uh, plantains. And they would bring that money to the state, to the committee, for the station. And that's how we rebuilt Radio Haiti. We were back on the air the, um, a few months later, you know, and it was, uh, 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 now we had responsibilities, you know, towards the people who had welcomed us. We had, so we felt that uh, what we had been doing, we just had to keep on doing more of it. And it was easier, of course, because even though, um, uh, the dictatorship was gone. Of course, there was the army. But the army, as I said earlier, had to appear democratic. They had to appear like uh, they were respecting human rights. Uh, and uh, uh, so we started intensively reporting in the streets. And I think those are the probably the most uh, um, fascinating years of our work, which was between 19, um, 
1986 and 1990, you know, when there was that popular movement and uh, um, where people were speaking out. And uh, um, it's, uh, um, you know, it's, we were carried by what was happening in the street. Uh, we didn't have to go look for information. Information came to us. You know, like uh, before, uh, um, you know, student groups started. Uh, I remember we were, uh, there was supposed to be a vote on the Constitution, a referendum on the Constitution. The army was uh, happy about part of the Constitution until they realized that the Constitution was taking power away from them. So they were getting ready and we f everyone felt around town that they were getting ready to stop the vote. And there were uh, neighborhood committees that were set up all over the city of Port-au-Prince. And the same thing happened in Cape Haitian, the same thing happened in other cities where people had, you know, were trying to stop the army for doing anything that would go against the vote the next day. So it's, uh, they would call us, they tell us, hey, we are in such and such a neighborhood, and this is what we are doing, send a reporter. So we were carried by them more than we actually went to look for information, what was the case before. And it was a very, uh, it was an amazing time. An amazing time because uh, uh, so much was happening and so much had to be changed. We were inheriting structures from a dictatorship and what people wanted most was justice. I was very surprised as a, as a reporter I did a, a series of um, interviews and a survey in uh, uh, a place like Cité Soleil in other um, slums of uh, Port-au-Prince. And what people said was what was most important to them. Before food, before lodging, it was justice. And we became more and more engaged in that in human rights, defending human rights, and uh, uh, justice. Um, unfortunately, at the time, we couldn't, um, you know, people didn't want to talk about the dictatorship anymore. And in that, in that sense, we did not help to enough to uh, remind people of what had happened, uh, to force it for, you know, to force, um, to stop that from happening again. I just felt uh, uh, that uh, we had so much to do to cover the streets, to cover what was happening, to cover, you know, uh, not only Port-au-Prince, and this is what was Radio Haiti's major strength, was covering the countryside and getting people to talk about what was happening in the countryside. And uh, we took it as a motto of our stations, whether it be uh, between uh, 1986 and 1990 or whether it was in 1994 when we came back, uh, that I would ask my reporters every morning, I would say, it's about time we have a cover story on the country outside. The country outside meaning the country that was not in Port-au-Prince, that was not the Republic of Port-au-Prince, where everything was concentrated. I said, give me a story. And they realized, even my, my reporters were from Port-au-Prince, most of them, and at the beginning they were, they said, but nothing is happening there. I said, you, you so-and-so go there for 15 days and you will tell me if nothing is happening. I want a cover story. And I think this uh, brought what was happening in the countryside among the peasantry, which uh, was still then the majority of the country, uh, into uh, the consciousness of people everywhere. And so, when did you start broadcasting primarily in Haitian Creole? Oh, we did start uh, uh, in the 70s, uh, late 70s, uh, around 70, we started 75, 76, and uh, uh, we added every time, first we had two programs in Creole, then we added three news programs in Creole, then, you know, so it, uh, uh, it became uh, uh, more and more so. Um, the news in Creole, of course, as a rule, uh, since we're doing so many interviews in Creole, 
there was always, even in the reporting that was in French, there was always a lot of Creole. And uh, uh, Creole, which had been mostly, uh, let's say, language of advertisement, became suddenly the language of news. And uh, uh, it became more and more relevant to people. Uh, you have to realize that everything was centered around French. Everything was centered around the Catholic Church. And here was a radio station talking freely about voodoo, talking freely about Creole, and having voices from below being heard. This was, uh, at the beginning, a very unique occurrence. Most of the radio stations at the time in 70, 75, 76 were in French. So what did this decision to broadcast in Creole mean both to, to the Haitian masses and to the elites, either the intellectual elites, political elites? Well, I think it, it meant, uh, it meant uh, definitely a lot to the majority of Haitians because it was the language they spoke. Uh, and we had been uh, uh, living you know, the travesty, uh, travesty of history by uh, believing that uh, everyone was, uh, in, was French speaking, which was not the case. Uh, you know, the judicial system was in French. People were being tried in a language they did not understand. Um, so to me, uh, it was, of course, obvious that uh, we would have that support uh, from, uh, um, from the masses. But we did get that support also from intellectuals uh, who felt that uh, it was part of Haitian identity. And uh, there was a big movement towards Haitian identity uh, which uh, is, is a very strong, has been strong throughout. And uh, if it meant uh, Creole and, uh, and uh, Vodou, let be it. You would have, of course, a number of people in the bourgeoisie who felt uh, uh, offended by Radio Haiti. And uh, I think remain offended by Radio Haiti very long until actually we closed our doors. So it's, uh, um, uh, I felt the support was overwhelming. Um, speaking of the Haitian bourgeoisie, that's, uh, that's, that's where you come from, right? That's where I come from, yes. So what, um, and what was that like in terms of your, yeah, your relationship with your family, but also that sense of identity and where? No, it doesn't, uh, the sense of identity uh, mm -hmm. uh, in my family always existed. Uh, I was raised, uh, I was the granddaughter of two judges. I was raised, you know, in the, the, the you know, with Haitian history. Uh, we were, uh, uh, my family was against the American occupation of 1915. Uh, in my family, as in Jean's family, as we, when we met, we could compare notes um, to, uh, even though I was in a Catholic school and I was uh, going to school in French, you know, but the sense of our identity as a people uh, was always transmitted to me by my family. This is not the case for uh, uh, every bourgeois family. Uh, and uh, it's obvious that uh, uh, we were, uh, both Jean and I, going uh, more or less against our uh, uh, social uh, groups. <laughs> <coughs> but it was, uh, uh, and at the beginning, I was uh, very unconventional. Jean was also. And <coughs> in a way, uh, we went against the grain. Uh, I think uh, I had to convince my father that uh, uh, he loved me, but he had a hard time uh, uh, accepting who I had become. A journalist, you know, uh, really involved with uh, uh, so many issues that were uh, uh, going more or less against the government. And um, I think he, li he lived all his life uh, in fear for me. I was not afraid, he was. Why weren't you afraid? You know, I decided, I think it was a conscious decision when I decided to go back to Haiti that nothing could scare me anymore. I had lived during my childhood through part of the Duvalier regime. Uh, I had seen the worst I could have seen. I'd suffered in my family uh, from the regime. Nothing could scare me anymore. And I don't think I've ever been scared since. So exile, um, 1991 to 1994, mm -hmm. how did that differ from your first exile? Uh, Jean was exploring New York, exploring a different life when he was there in 
1986 to uh, 1980 to 1986, Jean no longer felt, he felt failure. He felt that uh, uh, we had lost a battle, we had uh, uh, led, we had supported democratic elections in Haiti and we were at the heart of it. And uh, we had been carried by a whole movement who uh, wanted to create a different Haiti, to change Haiti. And uh, when uh, we had the coup in 1990, uh, seven months after Jean-Bertrand Aristide had uh, been in power, we just felt that uh, uh, we had to leave because they came and they shot at our house. Uh, we had to close the station, of course, because uh, uh, we knew we could not continue doing what we were doing. We felt, uh, Jean particularly, felt that uh, we had failed. And he took it really personally. He took it as it was his own failure. And I think it was a more, much more difficult time. It was not... Um, Jean was uh, uh, convinced that we had to do everything we could uh, to get the constitutional government back, which was Aristide's government, which was in exile then. And uh, um, Jean was obsessed by uh, how we could be tricked into another coup d'etat. Uh, he was uh, obsessed by the fact that uh, what did we do that was wrong? What, uh, you know, what was... Uh, uh, it was not about Radio Haiti, it was about the whole movement uh, because he felt we were just, you know, uh, the, the voices. And uh, um, I think it was a frustrating time for him, the four years we spent uh, uh, in the second exile. Um, in my case, I started working again. Uh, I think it helped me. Uh, it was difficult not to think about Haiti and to uh, be working in a radio station that was not carrying a popular movement. It was difficult to be working for the United Nations, uh, um, where I was uh, uh, supposed to be the very, uh, 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 let's say, objective, quote unquote. Let's say uh, uh, it was a different type of radio. It was not at all what I had had. It was the same techniques, yes, but it was a different, very different radio. I had to adapt to it, and uh, I needed. The, we needed the money. We needed the work. And uh, I did it, uh, but I, s I felt that it was much more difficult for Jean. What was he doing during those years? Uh, not very much. Uh, he was uh, writing a lot. Uh, he uh, was writing articles. He was, uh, uh, you know, it was all about Haiti. Everything was about Haiti. And so then when you came back in 94, we came back in 94, not, uh, I can, did not come back at the same time as Jean did because, you know, I had to give some warning at work. <laughs> this was the second time I was resigning and, uh, you know, the UN radio was starting to wonder, my God, every time she comes, she just, a few years later, she just resigns. Uh, so I had to stay a little longer. Uh, Jean came back earlier and uh, um, it's, uh, and he saw difficult things. You know, the assassination of uh, Antoine Ismery. At the time, uh, Aristide was not back yet. Jean was in Haiti. And uh, um, Antoine Ismery was one of, uh, uh, had carried the popular movement also. He was a businessman who had turned human rights defender. Um, things like this marked him a lot. When he finally returned completely, I mean, returned to live in Haiti, um, in 1994, uh, it just was, uh, uh, of course, happy that we were back. He didn't go back with Jean-Bertrand Aristide, as Jean-Bertrand Aristide offered him to, uh, because he felt he did not want to go back in a foreign plane. He didn't want to go back with foreign troops. Because of his childhood, he had been traumatized by the American occupation. He was a child during the American occupation. And uh, he, uh, in, you know, in 19, the 1930s, he still remembered, uh, you know, the Marines in the streets of Port-au-Prince. He was, he was uh, I don't know, 12 years old, 10 years old. So, it's, uh, um, so he didn't want to go back in a foreign plane, not with foreign troops. 
which is the way uh, Jean-Bertrand Aristide, the president of Haiti, came back. Uh, Jean came back a little later. We took a while to uh, put the station back on the air. It, was, it had been damaged. Uh, but that period from uh, 94 to uh, 2003, because we stayed until 2003, uh, was um, uh, not as exciting as the first one. The adrenaline was not flowing as much. We didn't have so many street demonstrations. Um, it was a time uh, when a number of, uh, uh, we found ourselves denouncing corruption. We found ourselves, you know, just uh, doing more work on uh, you know, we felt very much that uh, the, the return of uh, Aristide had not meant the end of corruption, had not meant the end of, you know, a number of things that we were against during uh, the military coup. And uh, we just felt that uh, uh, it was a difficult, it was a difficult period in a different way. Uh, not as exciting, not as, uh, as, uh, um, too many people had died. Too many people had been killed during the coup. Uh, there was the sense that uh, um, uh, when will that all stop? And as if we were back, every time we tried to move, we are back to square one, starting all over again. It was true of the station, but it was all true, also true of the country. We felt that every time we, se we seem to move, then we have a coup. And uh, this went on and on. In, uh, uh, so in 1994, uh, uh, we started working again with uh, uh, a different team of journalists. And uh, we trained them. And uh, uh, we did a lot of things on what had happened during our absence, uh, a lot of uh, uh, in-depth reporting on uh, the repression during the, the, the time of the coup d'etat. Uh, we did a lot of work on. Uh, on uh, a government trying to re-establish itself. And uh, uh, so we did a lot of reporting, uh, but it was not the type of, uh, of uh, atmosphere that existed before uh, until 1990. And of course, uh, uh, as w you know, we worked until uh, from 94 until uh, uh, 2000, you know, we worked uh, uh, Jean, uh, the station was uh, really uh, 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 having a tremendous amount of influence. Uh, uh, we had, uh, uh, and uh, it, it happened April 3rd, 2000. Jean was assassinated. So after Jean's assassination, we had to decide what to do about the station. And uh, um, I remember here something which uh, moved me deeply. Uh, about three weeks after Jean was killed, I gathered the journalists and I said, okay guys, you know what happened, of course, you know what happened. It has had an impact on you, uh, but I have decided I'm continuing. I am not going to hold it against any one of you if you tell me you can't take it. There was a silence. So I had there not only our reporters, I had there the reporters who were our stringers from the different uh, cities in Haiti. They were all there. There was a silence, and then one of them, Grégory Casimir, said, Michel, you're the captain of the team. We'll follow you. And um, I think moments like this make it worth it. And we continued, we continued um, reporting between 2000 and 2003, but realizing more and more through uh, our, the, the case we had introduced uh, against X, whoever, uh, for uh, Jean's assassination, we realized that there were a number of blockages all throughout the investigation. And uh, pursuing that case and covering that case as journalists uh, was for us a way of uh, pushing the judicial system, but at the same time, and to keep on what we thought we were doing earlier, which was uh, you know, being agent of change. Uh, by covering the case of Jean Dominique, in a way, we felt we were helping, in t helping that change. 
And uh, there were a lot of obstacles. Uh, a number of people died, were killed. Um, witnesses disappeared. Uh, there were uh, uh, times when uh, there were plots against the judge uh, where I had to request that the judge receive special protection. There were times when uh, uh, I would uh, reveal a plot that I had discovered against the judge on the air, so as to protect the judge. Um, so even though I could not uh, reveal everything that was happening, I could not, we could not have our own investigation. But at the same time, we would air voices talking about that investigation, why it was blocked, why uh, was the government not renewing the mandate of the judge at the time it was uh, President Aristide was back in power. So through that time when we were working, uh, it was also about continuing to do what we always did, covering the countryside, covering the peasantry, covering uh, what was happening in um, the slums of Port-au-Prince, uh, but also covering, of course, the administration, covering, you know, uh, the Senate, covering corruption issues. And um, in 2003, of course, in 2002, it was Christmas Day, they came and shot at me. They killed my bodyguard, a young man who uh, was 26 years old, Maxime Saeed. And, uh, of course, we had always joked about, uh, I don't need bodyguards. He would say, you need bodyguards. And I would say, uh, why, why would they want to kill me? I'm already dead anyway. And uh, I would say that jokingly, but half jokingly, because of course, parts of me died with John. And uh, um, Maxime said always said, I'm big. He was called, this, his nickname was Big. In English, Big. <laughs> and um, Maxime used to say, well, you know, I'm big enough. I can cover you if they shoot at you. Well, that day, um, the, I, man you know, I was driving the car. He was next to me. We managed to uh, enter the gate. Thank God I had taken a different ru uh, route that day. I entered the gate and uh, with the car. And Maxime stepped out of the car and stepped outside. And when he saw the armed men running from the corner where they were expecting me to the house, and immediately said, close the gate. The other one behind him, close the gate. And he was, he ran, while he was being shot at, he ran away from the house to protect the house. And the guys followed him because they could not, the, the gate was closed, it was a pretty high gate. And um, that's how he was killed. And after Maxime was killed, I uh, thought maybe I was the one attracting danger on the station. So I stopped broadcasting myself. My uh, uh, news hour in the morning was taken up by uh, uh, our chief editor, who was uh, uh, actually handling both, uh, um, both uh, the, the 6 o'clock and the 7 o'clock news, until finally I got everyone together and they started telling me what they had been going through. It was a different meeting from the one I told you about. Uh, it was uh, where they were telling me things they had never told me before the threats they had received, the fact that uh, one says my mother kicked me out of the house because she thinks that I am endangering my brothers and sisters, a wife who said I don't want you in the house either, you know, because they felt that uh, Haiti was, uh, Radio Haiti was uh, a dangerous pole, was attracting, uh, 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 you know, the thunder. So um, we decided after, um, Maxime's funeral that we had to close the station. I announced it in an um, editorial and I left that day, that same day, for Florida. And that was my third exile. Or is it my fourth? I don't keep count anymore. <laughs> so it's since 2003 I've been living in, this, in the US. Where do you think the sense of commitment and dedication that all the journalists had, where, where did that come from? I think uh, it was part of something so much larger than we were. It was about uh, uh, 
you know, it's a, it's a sense of, uh, I think for them, it was, uh, uh, as, for, as it was for us, the adrenaline flowing, it was also about the fact that you feel that people trust you and that you have a duty towards people uh, to tell the truth, to find that truth, and uh, uh, the fact that we were constantly supported by people uh, really made a tremendous difference for each one of them. And I think if you were to ask them that question today, I think they probably would tell you the same thing. Um, all of them, uh, and they were very reluctant to tell me that, uh, you know, we could close the station. Actually, the ultimate uh, uh, decision rested with me, and I felt I owed it to them to protect them. But they were all extremely disappointed at the same time that we had to close, because there was a sense of, uh, there was a, a, a solidarity within the newsroom. There was a solidarity uh, because we had gone through so much together. And this was true of the different th uh, teams at Radio Haiti. We have different teams of journalists at different times. And uh, the sense of solidarity, of being part of one entity. And uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, I have to say that after Jean was killed and I was doing the morning show by myself, I would go on the air at seven o'clock. And the first few weeks, I didn't understand what was happening because my reporters were not supposed to be at the station until about 8.30 when I finished the show. They took turns without telling me and they were standing across the way from me. There was the, uh, there was the uh, glass and there was always a reporter standing there so I wouldn't be alone. This type of, um, you know, just um, solidarity. Uh, kept us together through our professional work, kept us together as people. And I think this, um, you know, this might have explained why they accepted the dangers, why they accepted, uh, you know, very few of them left in spite of everything we went through. Very few left for security reasons. You know, some left for different opportunities in other radio stations, some left for, uh, because they were going abroad, some, but, um, it was amazing how the team that went through Jean's assassination stayed until, until the end. So you trained them all, right? Very I professionally, I trained them all. I didn't teach them to be people, and they were great people. That's good. Yeah, let's. 